All right. Now, um, as, a, as a preacher, I'm instructed to preach the whole counsel of God. Okay, there's, there's not one thing in this book that I'm supposed to leave unturned and unpreached. Unfortunately today, you know, we live in a world where, where God's truth is being attacked on many fronts, and there's a lot of churches out there that aren't preaching all the Bible. They're only picking and choosing just certain parts that they like and certain parts that they just want to focus on. Um, we need to hear all of it. It's all important. All of God's word is meaningful for us. There's, there's a lot of negativity in the Bible. And, and unfortunately, you know, we live in a world, again, where, where God's word's being attacked. And there's many fronts. So it's, it's also a time where we live in a time where preachers are failing and they don't have the boldness to stand up and to fight against the wickedness and to fight against these attacks that are coming against God's word. And, and it's just getting worse and worse and worse, it seems. Now, because of this, there's even that much more of a need today for, for preaching, for hard preaching against sin, to just to, to, for the preacher to, to give these messages that are warnings and to warn people about how wickedness is going to ruin your life and, and, and how these attacks are happening on all fronts. Because wickedness is getting worse, it, it, it drives that much more of a need to preach against things. Now, these sermons tend to be negative in nature. So you, you come in and you're thinking like, oh, man, I'm hearing, you know, this sermon and, and I'm doing that. And, you know, it could, it could maybe make you feel, you know, bad or whatever. But now the whole goal of that, the purpose of that, just, just to explain real quick, you know, the purpose isn't just to make you feel bad. That's not the goal at all. The purpose is just to give you the warning, to give you the message and just say, hey, look, God has got rules for us, and these are his rules, and, and this is what he wants you to, to, to live by. And they're for our benefit. They're not for our hurt. They're not, they're not to, to, to restrict you from doing fun things. It's, it's No, it's for your benefit. The same way that with your children, you, know, you allow them to do certain things, and there are certain things you don't allow them to do, not because you hate them or you don't want them to have any fun, because you know what's best for him. And it's the same reason why God has given us rules is because, hey, he knows what's best for us. He doesn't want us to go out and getting in trouble. I mean, you know, telling us not to commit adultery and not to kill and not to steal. These are good rules to live by. He knows that if you go out and do these things, your life is going to be miserable. You're going to ruin your life when you go out and do those things. But that's not what this sermon is about at all. So <laughs> I want to explain that because... I need to remember, even as a, as a preacher, especially with all of these bad things going on and with such a need to, to, to preach against sin and to preach against the wickedness, hey, there's also a lot of good things in the Bible as well. There's a lot of positive. So we don't ever want to become unbalanced, whether it's in our life or in our view of God and our view of anything. Now, there's, unfortunately, there's a lot of churches that are unbalanced and all they preach about ever is just the positive, the positive, the positive, the positive, the positive. And they never preach on the negative stuff of saying, hey, look, you, you know, this is wrong. You shouldn't be doing this. Which is kind of why we, you know, it, it might seem like a lot of the independent fundamental Baptist churches, they just seem like always negative. And, and we ought not to, to, to be that way. Now, the Bible is, when you look at it through, when you read all the pages of this book, you will probably find that there's more negative than there is positive. And there's, more, there's more instructions from God telling us not to do certain things. And, and warning us about bad things happening than there is necessarily about the good things. Which is one of the reasons why I preach the number of sermons I do about, you know, about sin and wickedness versus you know, the positive good things. But tonight, you're in for a treat. So don't <laughs> hopefully you won't have to leave here thinking like, oh man, I can't believe you railed on my sin tonight. Because tonight, we're, we're definitely going to be preaching on one of the extremely positive things from the Bible, and that's who we are in God's eyes. Now, I'm hoping that this sermon tonight will, will help edify you and help strengthen you and help embolden you and, and, just, and just help you understand how important you are as an individual. Every individual alive on this earth today has importance. You have life. God has given you life. And if you're saved today, you are a child of God, and that is extremely important. We're going to go through a lot of different things and, and, and how important the, the value and importance that you have in your life. And even though you might not feel like you're very important, even though you might not feel like you're having a good impact or, or whatever, you do. You, and you are. And, and we're going to see how important you are. That's why we started off here in Romans 5, because the most important thing to realize is how much God just loves us. 
The amount of love that God has for us is immense. Romans 5, look down at verse 6. We read the entire chapter. Look at verse 6. It says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now what that's saying there is basically he's saying, look, scarcely for a righteous man. So like if you have a man who's really good, I mean, they're a really good person. They're doing a lot of good works. He's saying scarcely, meaning rarely, not very often is someone going to give their life for that other person, even though they're really good and doing a lot of good works. He says, yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. Some people are willing to give up their life for someone who's a really good person, a really good man, you know, someone you love and respect. Some people are willing to give their life for that person, but it's not very often. It's not very common. But what he's, what he's doing in saying that, he's comparing that to, but God, God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we are not that good of people. I mean, a lot of people have a tendency to think like really highly of themselves, but in God's eyes, you know, no matter, and it's not that I'm not trying to down you either. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, you shouldn't be doing good work, but in God's eyes, look, we've all done wrong. We've all sinned. And according to God, he's got a punishment of sin that's hell. The punishment for our sins is, is to be tortured and tormented in hell forever. And that is not pleasant, but that is the punishment that God has had that has on our sin. And that's how serious it is. And when he looks at us, we are completely undeserving of his love based on our actions, based on what we've done that's wrong. But he still loved us. And not only did he love us, he loved us enough. God loved us enough. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And, and it's worded like that for us to understand. Yes, Jesus Christ is the son of God. Jesus Christ was offered up as a sacrifice to be put in our place to die for our sins. And if you think about that, you know, I have three little girls. I know you have a son. And if you could imagine giving up your child, your child's life, right? The child that you love is dear to you, your child. And for God, it was his only begotten son, right? His only son. To give that life for, someone, for, for other people. And not only for other people. It's not like he gave his life for someone who was, you know, deemed worthy and like a really good person. No, he gave, he was able to give up his son's life for sinners, for people who didn't deserve it at all. Yet he showed that much love. Now, I don't know about you because my love isn't as great as God's. I cannot imagine giving up the life of one of my daughters for anybody else to just say like, and, and not only anyone else, but think about a murderer, an adulterer, a thief. Right? Whatever, whatever. Whatever it may be. Any, any sin. You think about someone and say, like, yeah, well, this person, this person murdered somebody. Well, I'm going to give my daughter up to pay for what they've done that's wrong. That's, that is an amazing amount of love that God has for us to be able to do that. To say, you know what? I'm going to give my only begotten son to pay for what you've done that's wrong. I mean, we've all done our own sins. Let's face it. I mean, we are responsible for our own actions. We've done wrong. We, and, you know, whether it be telling lies, whether it be stealing, whatever it may be, whatever we've done that's wrong, whatever our sins are, we don't deserve what, what the love that God has bestowed upon us. And because we don't deserve it, it's, it's that much more great. It's that much more immense to, to fathom how God is able to do that for us and how Jesus Christ, who never sinned one time, never did anything wrong, never you know, he obeyed completely perfectly, helped people out, did everything he possibly could, the miracles he performed, and then just to give up himself and offer himself up as a sacrifice to pay for our sins is an incredible amount of love. Now, it's important to remember that love in your life on a daily basis, on a regular basis, because there are times that we go through where you might not be feeling that great about yourself or you might be, you know, depressed and, and just thinking that everything is wrong. Hey, God loved you individually so much to have his son die on the cross for you. Every single person individually, he died for you specifically. 
Yes, he died for the whole world, but you are in that world and you are one of the people that God thought of when Jesus Christ came and died on that cross. You are important to him. You are very important to God. He views you and loves you and wants you to be saved. If you're not saved, if you are saved, you know, that's why he went and did what he did so that you can be saved, so that you can be with him in heaven because he loves you and he does not want. The Bible says that the God is not willing that any should perish. God does not want people dying and going to hell. Now, that is the place where, where we deserve because of our sins, and God's a God of justice. But because he doesn't want us going there, and he loves us so much, he gave us the way out, and the way out is a free ticket by just putting your faith in Christ. It's a free gift. He says, look, it's free. I'm just offering it to you. Please accept it. Take this gift. Accept this gift. It's eternal life. You can never lose it. It's yours forever. I love you so much. I want you to have this. That is what God's doing today. And, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of people that reject that gift. And we know where they're going to end up. But, but that doesn't change God's love for them. God so loved the world. He loves everybody. He loved everyone to, to, enough to offer up his only begotten son to sacrifice himself for us. Again, something, an amazing thing we can take comfort in every day of our life, just knowing that God has that love for us. And it doesn't stop there. We're going to look at a bunch more verses. Um, turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 8. We're, I'm going to get there in a few minutes, but it's just a few chapters over from Romans 5. Turn to Romans 8. But in Matthew 10, verse 30, the Bible says, But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. God knows how many, I mean, think about that. Like, I think about all the hairs on my head. He knows how many hairs are on your head. That's how well he knows you. He knows every, he's able to count every number, every hair on your head. He says, fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. This is what Jesus was saying. That Look, God knows you so well. He loves you so much. He's like, look, you are of way more value. And again, we have to get the context of the story why he's saying you have more value than many sparrows. But um, there's the fact that God knows the number of hairs on your head. That's how intimately he knows about you and he knows you. In Psalm 40, verse 5, the Bible says, Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done. And thy thoughts, which are to usward, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. What he's saying here is that God's thoughts towards us, the way when God's thinking about us, the amount of thoughts that he has towards us, he says they're more than can be numbered. You can't even count the amount of thoughts that God is thinking about you. Individually, God thinks about you. And think about that. Think about there's what, 7 billion people on the earth today, right? Somewhere around there. A huge amount of numbers. Seven billion. That's, a, that's an enormous amount of souls. Enormous amount of people. And the thoughts that God has towards every single one of those people is more than can be numbered for everybody. Individually. God, has, God loves us. He cares about us so much. Again, it's something that we don't want to take for granted because a lot of times in this world you can feel isolated. You can feel alone. You can feel like nobody understands you. You could feel like, why am I going through all this stuff, all these problems? God knows and God loves you and God's thinking about you. Okay, And, and we might not always see the evidence of God in our life immediately. That's not something you can always pick out. Okay? And, and that's part of the problem that people have with, with getting depressed and with feeling down is that you don't always see that. We were talking about this today. You know, you could feel like, man, I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm doing all this stuff. Why are all these bad things happening to me? We, don't all, we can't always see this. We can't always see what God is doing in our life. But look, we have lots of scripture and we're going to get to even more already that God understands what we're going through. God is not going to allow us to go through more than we're capable of going through. God is going gonna, is gonna to see us through. He loves us. He loved us so much. Look, if God loved us so much to, to, to give His only begotten Son to die on the cross for us, do you think He's then just going to abandon us later? No way. No way. No way would God do that. He's going to see us through. But see, God has wisdom and knowledge that we don't have. We can't always see because we're stuck in the middle of things. We, always, we can't see what's going to be the best outcome for us in the end. Now, looking back, oftentimes you can look back and say, oh, I could see now 
why I went through this, you know, this bad event or this bad event and it turned out ended up being good. But I had to go through that in order for things to work out the way that they did. When you're in the middle of those hard times, you're thinking, how could this ever work out good? Right? We don't understand. But God knows what's best for us and God's able to see the end. He knows the end from the beginning. And he's able to, to direct our paths. Now, we ought to be living godly and walking righteously for him to be directing our paths so that we're not just going off on our own, that we're doing what he wants us to do. But, I mean, the fact of the matter is still going to remain that, that if you're a child of God, he's going to be a loving father to you. And he's going to want to do what's best for you. You're in Romans chapter 8. Look at verse number 35. Verse number 35 of Romans chapter 8. The Bible reads, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded... That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He's saying there, look, nothing can separate us from God's love. Nothing. And that's one of the, you know, another great portion of scripture that tells us, look, you can't lose your salvation. Once you get saved, hey, you're saved eternally. It's forever. It's something that you can't lose. It's a gift that's been given to you. It's eternal life. Nothing can separate you from the love of God, from the love of Christ. Now, it's also interesting to note here, too, because we were just talking about going through hard times, having bad things happen to you. Well, this is exactly why he's bringing this up. Look at verse 35 again. It says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And he starts bringing up a lot of negative things. Tribulation. He says, shall tribulation. Tribulation is, is hard times. You're, you're experiencing afflictions, um, turmoil, distress in your life. That's tribulation. That's what he says. Or distress. Or persecution, right? People coming down on you. People persecuting you. Or famine. Famine is going without food. Hey, we, you know, we're not having enough food. Or nakedness, we don't have any, you know, clothing to clothe ourselves with. Or peril or sword. I mean, people just, just coming at you. Like all, all forms of bad events, right? All negative things. All kinds of horrible things that can be happening in your life. But he's basically saying, look, none of these things that can happen to you are going to separate you from the love of Christ. Christ still has that love for you no matter what's going on in your life. That love is still there. He says, for as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Now, it's important to note that too, that throughout the Bible, the Bible says, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So again, just because you're getting persecuted or because you're, you know, you're um, experiencing a lot of negative things, hey, the Bible says that we need to expect that when you start doing right, you, you might think the opposite, right? You might think that like, well, I'm doing right, so bad things shouldn't be happening to me. Everything should be going right. But that's not the case because the more you start doing right, the more you're going to get attacked. The more you start living godly and righteously, the more the world is going to hate that. I mean, think about this. What did the world do to Jesus Christ when he came on this earth? Now, he lived righteously. He did everything that was right, but the Bible says that he was a man of sorrows. He went through a lot of persecution. I mean, he, he went through the, the beating, the whipping, the mocking, the putting the crown of thorns on his head, people spitting in his face, smacking him on the head, you know, bowing down their knee. They put a robe on him and mocked him like he's a king. And this is God in the flesh. And this is how they treated him. And he was a righteous man. He did everything right. He never sinned. He did not do anything that deserved one little bit of what he received on this earth. He did. I mean, he helped people. He healed the sick. I mean, people who were blind, he gave them sight. He did everything right. I mean, you should look at this guy and be like, this is amazing. He ought to be our king. And instead, so many people rejected him and hated him and attacked him and persecuted him. Why? Because they heard the truth and they hated it. 
people don't like. He was a preacher of righteousness and of truth, and a lot of people don't like to hear the truth. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people that when the truth is preached, if you're living in sin, if you're living in wickedness, you don't want to hear about it. Now, we ought to. We ought to want to hear about it and say, you know what? I don't want to do that anymore. I'm going to get right. But a lot of people, they don't want to hear it, and they'll, they'll actually fight against it. And that's what happened with Jesus Christ. Now, again, he did everything right, yet had a lot of bad things happen to him. And that, you know what? You can be doing everything right and still have bad things happen to you. But you know what? God loved Jesus the whole time, and he knew. And you know what? Loved him probably even more. Because he continued to do that which is right. And if you can continue to do that which is right, hey, God's going to love you for that even more. And God's going to love you anyway. Look, none of these things can separate you from God's love. His love will always be there. But think about how much more satisfied with you if your own personal son, if you teach them and you train them and you, and you tell them, look, you're going to go through hard times, but this is how you deal with it. This is how you deal with the, with the enemies. This is how you deal with it when people come and attack you. And he listens to everything that you said. In the end, you're going to look at that son and be, and, and, and be very happy and joyful and, and love him that much more because they actually listened to what you said. And, and that's the way that we can view it with God is, look, God's given us instructions. He tells us how to deal with things in our life. And he wants us to maintain our integrity. He wants us to maintain our faithfulness towards him and understand that, look, bad things will happen to you. And he warns us in advance. He tells us, look, you're going to go through hard times. You're going to go through tribulation. You're going to have these things happen. But keep your faith. Look, my love is always here for you. That None of those things are going to separate you from my love that I have towards you. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter is near the end of the Bible. 1 Peter is right, right near the end of the Bible. If you go backwards... From the end of the Bible, you have Revelation and Jude and uh, Third John, Second John, First John, and then you're going to have Second Peter and then First Peter. Going backwards, it's really close to the end of the Bible. We're going to read First Peter chapter number one. First Peter chapter one. Look at verse number three. The Bible says, "Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ." which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. What well, is it saying here? If you're saved... You're born again. You're a child of God. You're going to receive an inheritance, right? You think about an inheritance today when people, um, well, if you have a relative that passes away, a relative that dies, sometimes they'll have money left over, their goods, all the things that they've, they've acquired in this world. Well, they'll have an inheritance that then passes down to another family member, right? Oftentimes with parents, when they pass away, their inheritance goes to their children. It goes to, to their sons and their daughters. And, um, they receive an inheritance. Well, because we're saved, if you put your faith in Christ, when you're saved, you are also going to have an inheritance in heaven. And what the, the words that I really like, I want to point out here in verse number four, right at the end, it says it's inheritance reserved in heaven for you. For you. Individually, it's for you. God has reserved a place in heaven. He has reserved an inheritance for you. God thought about you specifically. You, Brother Sebastian, you, Brother Eric, he's thought about you specifically and says, this is a place in heaven for you. There's so many people in the world, but God's thoughts are individually to each person. I have reserved a place in heaven. I have a mansion for you in heaven. Think about that. And, and again, this is, hopefully this is edifying you that, that when you do go through the hard times, hey, think on these things. Think about this, because this, you know, this life, it's going to be over and before you know it. I'm 37 years old, and, and <laughs> the time just seems to be going faster and faster and faster. And I'm still a young man, but it's, it's amazing how you could just look back, and man, that time just goes by so fast. This life is going to be over before you know it. But heaven is forever. And God has a place, an inheritance. He set aside just for you. 
So I've made this place just for you. And it's going to be a great place. And all, I mean, these, these scriptures are very comforting for us to keep in mind, and they all apply to all believers. Anyone that's a believer in Christ, all these verses apply to you. Now, I also want to point out the importance of who you are in God's eyes. Because God might see you a little bit differently than you think. Number one, as a believer, if you're born again, if you're saved, you are a priest. You're in 1 Peter. Look at chapter number 2. Look at verse number 5. The Bible says, Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Jump down to verse number 9. It says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So he's saying there, a think about a royal priesthood, right? That's royalty. That's, you think about royalty in today's, I mean, those are the people that are set up and, they're in, and you know, a lot of people show respect unto them and, and everybody you know, admires them or whatever because they're royalty. Well, I don't care about being royalty in this world, but if I'm going to be considered royalty in God's eyes, hey, that's something to, be, you know, to think about and, and to, to think of yourself, hey, I'm part of a royal priesthood. That's a job that's important. For one, I mean, being a priest, right? Being a priest of God, that's an important job. And he's saying, look, you're a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood. <clears throat> he says, in time past, you weren't a people, but now you are. After you get saved, you are. You, are, you, are, um, you, you had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. And not only mercy, but God has elevated you to the point of being in a royal priesthood. Not only are you a priest, you're also a son of God. I'll read these verses for you. You don't have to turn there. But in John chapter 1, verse number 12, the Bible says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, of course, not everybody in this world is a son of God. It's only to those that believe on his name. Those are the ones that receive the power to become a son of God, to become a child of God. When you put your faith in Christ, you are born again. Your spirit is born inside of you. You become God's child. Now, this is my favorite title of all the ones that we're going to list here. Being a son of God, I, I love that so much. It, it's such a great comfort knowing that God is my father. because, And, and he's a loving, good father. Right? I realize today, unfortunately, unfortunately, we have fathers that are not good fathers, that don't love their children the way they ought to. But thank God, God is a good father. And for anyone who has known the love of a good father, that is a great feeling. That is, that is, that is so enormous to, to know that, hey, I've got a father that's watching out for me, that's looking out for me, that loves me, that wants me to do what's right, and that thinks about me. My hairs are numbered. He knows all about me. He wants me to do good. He's, he's pushing for me. He's, you know, he's rooting for me. And, and he's looking out for me. I'm his son. There's a lot of comfort you could take in that. And again, you know, this illustration points perfectly to not being able to ever lose your salvation the same way that your children are never going to become, not become your children anymore, no matter what they do. No matter what we do in this life, hey, if you, if you put your faith in Christ, you are God's child. You are his son. You are his daughter. Oh. <clears throat> so if you're, if you're his son, you know, nothing can change that fact. Once you're born into his family, you can't change that. Romans chapter 8 says the same thing. In verse 16, it says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs... Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Again, the Bible's um, referring to us as being children, and because we're children of God, we're heirs. We're going to have an inheritance. That's what an heir is. It's someone who receives an inheritance. Not only are we sons of God or children of God, we're also ambassadors. 
Now think about the importance of being in Bethlehem. First of all, think about importance, before I move on to that, think about the importance of being a son of God. Right? You think about people today, and again, you know, the, the, the son or daughter of, of the king or the president or whatever, you know, they're kind of looked up to, and they have a certain role to fill as being a child of someone of that importance, right? Someone in that type of position. Well, think about being a son of God. I mean, God has, has a position above everybody. God is more important than anything and anyone in saying, hey, you're his son. Think about that on how we ought to live and how we ought to behave ourselves because the children often reflect on the parents, right? Like your children, you, you want them to obey and, and to do what's right. and You, you want to be able to, to bring them out in public and they can, they can act normal. And, and when people see how they behave, hey, that's going to reflect on the parents. And that's just normal. That's the way it is. Well, hey, for us, if you're a believer, if you're saved, you're a son of God. You're a child of God. You're a daughter of God. We need to behave in a way that's going to be acceptable where, where God can see that and be pleased with our behavior. It's an important position, being a son of God, being a priest. Those are both very important roles to play. Also, an ambassador for Christ. And again, you think of an ambassador, an ambassador is an important job. You know, we have ambassadors in the United States. What's an ambassador? They go to another country, and what they're doing is they're representing our country, right? So if they go, if we have ambassadors in, you know, Saudi Arabia or whatever, they're speaking on behalf of all of us people here. That's what an ambassador does. Well, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 20, it says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. The Bible saying, look, we are to be ambassadors for Christ because Christ is no longer walking around on this earth as he did at one point. He is not physically here. So what he's done, he says, okay, look, you're a believer. You are now an ambassador for me. I need you to go around and to tell people the things that I'm not telling them anymore because I'm no longer on this earth. You need to go out and be my ambassador and speak for me and, and, and say, look, and this is exactly what we do when we go out soul winning. We go out talking to people and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's saying, because he says in, um, in the verse I just read, it says, we pray you in Christ's stead, meaning, you know, because Christ isn't here, in his place, we are telling you, be ye reconciled to God, which is exactly what you're doing when you get saved, because you have sins that need to be paid for. They need to be reconciled with God. If you have sins and you don't have Christ, hey, you have a debt to pay. You have a sin debt that you owe of hell. When we go out and show people, hey, look. Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid for all of your sins. The Bible says right here, you know, and they said, what, should, what, you know, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Hey, that's how you get reconciled to God. That's how you can have all of your sins forgiven, all of your sins wiped away. We need to be that ambassador for Christ to let people know, hey, this is what he did for you. Again, another important job. Look, we as believers have important jobs to fill. We are important. Your, your place and your standing in God's eyes is one of importance. God cares about you. He loves you. And your role is important. We're also judges. Maybe you didn't notice because a lot of people these days say, judge not, judge not, judge not. And they just like to repeat one, two little words as part of a verse without even reading the whole thing. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 3, it says, Know ye not that we shall judge angels how much more things that pertain to this life. And again, if you think about a judge, a judge is typically seen as a respected position, right? An important position in society that, hey, if you have a judge, they need to be able to determine between right and wrong. They need to be able to, to assess a situation and look at evidence and say, this is justice, right? This, is, this person did wrong. They did violence against this other person. And, and here's justice. It's going to be handled. And they're kind of in charge of making sure that justice takes place. That's what a judge does. Hey, in God's eyes, we're to be judges. He says, we're going to judge the angels. Right? We're made lower than the angels, but one day we're going to judge angels. He says, how much more things that pertain to this life? The last thing, the Bible points, another name, well, another name, another title, another position that we have as believers is a soldier. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. 
We need to endure those hard times. This was endure hardness. Bad things happen. Hardness happens. Hey, endure it. As a good soldier, look, you're in a fight. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the, the spiritual wickedness in high places. This is what our fight is against. It's not a physical fight, right? It's, it's, against, it's against principalities and powers. It's against ideas. It's against the devil. It's against, it's against wickedness. That is the, the fight that we're in, and we need to be soldiers. Look, whether you're a priest a son of God, an ambassador, a judge, a soldier. These are all very important roles. These are all very important positions. And all of these roles God has, has, has assigned to us. You have importance. They're individually important. God wants us to fill all these roles. That's how important you are to God. Don't let Satan get you down and make you think that you can't make a difference. Don't let him win, in a sense, by, by you not thinking of yourself even appropriately and how important you are to God and how much God loves you. He loves you tremendously. He's given you these jobs. He's given you these roles. Hey, you are important. God's given you an honor by filling these roles. I mean, it's an honor just to even be suggested and say, hey, I mean, think about it. If someone were to say, I want you to represent our entire country and be the ambassador of the United States, that's an honor. That's an honor bestowed on you thinking like, wow, you really think I can do this? You really think I'm worthy of that job? God wants you to be an ambassador for him. Everybody individually wants you to be an ambassador for him. He wants you to be a, you know, a judge, a soldier. These are all important roles to play. Bible says in 1 Peter chapter number 2, are we still there? Are you guys still in 1 Peter chapter 2? Look at verse number 1. 1 Peter chapter 2, look at verse number 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. And then in, um, in chapter 1, verse 13, the Bible says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Now, of course, it's not going to be easy. You know, these jobs are real jobs. They're not jobs that will be taken lightly either. You know, I mean, look, God loves you. He has faith in you. He has confidence in you. He wants you to fill these jobs, but it's going to take work. It's not something that just necessarily comes easily. Of course, it's going to take some work. And that's why we just, I just read some of these verses because, look, the Bible's telling us we need to change. We need to start living right. We need to start just adhering to his word. We need to, to be holy. You know, God is holy. He's perfect. He says, be holy for I am holy. Look, this is what I expect of you. I want you to do this. He says, as obedient children. Look, you're a son of God. I want you to be obedient children. I don't want you to be bad children. I don't want you just disregarding and disobeying everything that I tell you in the Bible. I want you to do what I tell you to do. Be an obedient child. And hey, he blesses his obedient children. He loves all of his children. But <laughs> any, any father that loves their child when they start being disobedient, guess what? They're going to discipline them. Because they love him. And if we start being disobedient to God, we'll experience his disciplining too. Because he loves us. I don't know about you, but I don't really want to go through that much disciplining by God. I'd rather just be blessed by God and, and have a great relationship with him. And if we, if we just follow his simple commandments, and his commandments aren't grievous. They're not, they're not that bad. They're not that hard to follow. Um, if, if we're honest with ourselves, it's really not, he's not telling us not to do that much. They're good for us. Um, it's very important to understand all of those roles that we just went through because it's easy to get depressed in today's world. It's easy to get down, especially get down on yourself and think that maybe you don't have very much worth or you don't, you don't feel like you have much value. You, you know, the, just everything's bearing down on you. But we also need to maintain the proper perspective on who we are and how important we are to God in order to help prevent us from becoming depressed. Now, it's also important to maintain the proper balance. And I'll explain what I mean by that because there are many places in the Bible where we're also taught to be meek 
and to be humble. So even though we are given all these important jobs, right, that ought not to go to our heads in the sense that we're just lifted up in pride. Right now, these are all important roles and they're, they're roles that God wants us to to follow and to obey. But we ought not to let that completely just go to our heads and be lifted up with this pride. The Bible says in Philippians chapter two, verse three, it says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now, of course, we need to do this. So it doesn't diminish from the roles that we need to fill by any means. But, and, and sometimes, the reason I'm even bringing this up is that sometimes people teach on humility and it gets distorted into not putting the proper value on yourself. So being meek and being humble doesn't mean to, that, that you look at yourself as dirt or as invaluable, right? That's not what being meek and humble is. All it is is you're esteeming other people better than yourself. So consider this, right? A, a person that sees themselves as having no value at all. Like if you just look at yourself and you just think that you're worthless, you are just no good at all, it's not going to be very hard to esteem others better than yourself in that situation. And even if you esteem them better, you might not even be esteeming them very well at all anyways if you don't see yourself as, as being valuable whatsoever. Right? Do you know do you know I'm getting like like if you see yourself way down here, in order to esteem others better than yourself, you say, okay, well I'm doing that, and you esteem other people like right there. Well, you're still not esteeming others that I mean, great, you're esteeming them better than yourselves. But if you have a, a view of yourself where, hey, I'm an ambassador, I'm a child of God, you know, your value is gonna you're gonna see your own value as being important, as being high, which it is. In God's eyes, you have a lot of importance. You have a lot of value. There are so many individuals. The Bible is full of individuals that have done great, mighty, many things for God, that have done great works for God, have, have, have changed so many people's lives through one person's actions. And you can be that one person too. Anybody can. You can have an extreme impact on other people's lives. But if you have the understanding of your value in God's eyes and God sees you as someone that he loves individually, as someone he loves uniquely, and that you have all these roles to fill and God thinks you're worthy to fulfill those roles, hey, and you have that value of yourself, but now you esteem others better than yourself? And you say, you know what? I know I have an important role, but now I'm going to consider other people to be, you know, to be better than me. I'm going I'm to look on their things more than on my own you're going to be esteeming them so much more because you already have a good value sense of yourself. Does that make sense? Um, and, and that's how we, I think that's a balanced view of how we ought to have, you know, we, we never want to get ourselves lifted up to where we think, well, I'm way more important than you, right? That's a bad, proud attitude to have. We need to have an attitude of, well, no, you're more important than me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I can to help you out and to lift you up and to do things for you. I'm not going to worry so much about myself. Now, I do have an important job to fill, an important role to play, and a lot of things I have to do that are going to be important to God, but I'm going to do what I can to minister unto you. And that's why Jesus Christ himself, I mean, God in the flesh said, I came here not to, min to be ministered to, but to minister. He came to be a minister unto other people. Jesus Christ came to help other people out. He focused on other people. He didn't focus on himself. When he was staying up all night praying, when he was going without food, when he was traveling around to so many people to do as much good work as he can and healing people. Look, he wasn't taking vacations and thinking about himself and saying, how much fun can I have and seeing the sights. Every waking moment, the man was out doing good work. And just and, and this good work involved helping other people out. It wasn't building up himself. It wasn't building a house for himself or, 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 or doing anything, you know, building a business. He didn't do any of that stuff. He went out helping other people. And that's the example that we have. And that's how we, we ought to esteem other people better than ourselves. But again, keep in mind how much God loves you and how important you are in God's eyes. I'm going to wrap it up with this. In Philippians 1.6, the Bible says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. We can have confidence and satisfaction knowing that, hey, God has, be if you're saved, you've received the Holy Spirit, God has begun a good work inside of you. He's begun a good work and he will finish it. And this is talking about until the day of Jesus Christ, when Christ comes back and we receive a new glorified body. He's going to finish that work in you. And also in John 14, 26, the Bible says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, 
whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Hey, if you're saved, you've got the Holy Ghost living inside of you. The Holy Spirit lives literally inside of you. You have God in you. That's how important you are. I mean, God loves you so much. Everything we already mentioned, He knows everything about you. And not only that, He's given you of Himself to live inside of you and to be a comforter, someone to provide you comfort, someone to, to help to build you up during those hard times. God hasn't left you alone. He's with you all the time. We just need to remember that, understand that. God will, God, Jesus Christ said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That is an important promise to remember. If you're saved today, look, no matter what you do, no matter where, where you go and the things that you're going through, God will always be there with you. That, that, is, that is amazing promise. It's an amazing love that God has towards us. Don't ever forget that. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. God, we thank you for your unspeakable love that you have for us. God, it's so hard to even put it into words. You've done a magnificent job in the Bible of expressing your love towards us, dear God. And um, Lord, it, it, it truly is amazing as, as a lowly sinner to have received such a great gift of salvation from you, dear Lord. We love you. We thank you. We, we can't even begin to, to even probably fully comprehend the love that you have towards us, but, but we are very thankful. Help us to, to never be forgetful about this, dear God. Help us to, um, to be thankful for, for the amount of love you have for us and, and show that to you by, by obeying what you've told us to do and by following your commandments, dear Lord. And um, I pray that you would please help us especially in our, in our hard times, to remember this, dear, go, dear God, but also in the good times that we don't ever lose sight of how important we are in your eyes. Help us to live up to these roles that you've, you've given us, to be an ambassador, to be a soldier, to be a priest, to be a, a, just a good child. Dear Lord, help us to, to live up to these roles that you felt appropriate to give unto us, dear God. And um, we love you, and we thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray, amen. All right.